Welcome, everyone. On behalf of Notre Dame International, I want to welcome you all to our Global Roundtable series. I'm Father Bob Dowd, Assistant Provost for Internationalization and Associate Professor of Political Science here at Notre Dame. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you to our roundtable today. The Global Roundtable series is devoted to discussing matters of vital importance in ways that highlight Notre Dame's global reach, enliven our Catholic mission, and spark ideas for research and service. Today's roundtable is, is titled Race and Building Communities of Belonging. And it's co-sponsored with the Department of Africana Studies, the Department of Political Science, and the Kellogg Institute for International Studies at Notre Dame. Our moderator is Professor Diane Pinderhus, Chair of the Department of Africana Studies and Professor of Political Science. And before turning it over to Diane, I just want to quickly review our guidelines for our time together today. Uh, everyone except the panelists will have their microphones muted. So if you'd like to ask a question, we'd ask you to use the chat feature, which is at the bottom of the Zoom console. Um, again, many, many thanks for joining us. We'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can, uh, but we may, we may not be able to get to every question. So, so thanks again for joining us. And with that, I'm just going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Diane Pinderhues. Diane. Thank you, Father Bob. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I was very excited when um, my esteemed colleague invited me to participate in this uh, seminar. And I was uh, more than happy to join in discussing the issues that have arisen um, in, the, in the wake of the pandemic, um, the issues of race that we know are all over the American environment. And so I wanted to, I was very happy to be able to um, engage with all of you and with our panelists today. As um, I'll remind you that the title of the panel today is Race and Building Communities of Belonging, Perspectives from the US, the UK and, and Brazil. My job will be to introduce the panelists and to um, ask a first question. And then really, we'll want to engage in a conversation. So I won't be doing a lot of intervening, but we'll from time to time. And then, of course, we'll be taking questions from the audience. So I'll do a brief introduction of the panelists and then, um, then ask a question that will allow them to give you a better sense of themselves. Um, their three come from very different locations and they bring uh, different um, elements in their background. So Michael Adu is director of the London Global Gateway Law Program is an, and is an international law and human rights specialist. He previously worked at the University of Exeter where he earned a master of law and doctoral degrees. He was originally from Ghana um, and holds a diploma in international human rights law from the International Institute of Human Rights at the University of Strasbourg, France. <clears throat> in addition to his work in the universities, Adu has held several leadership positions with the United Nations. The UN Human Rights Council appointed him in 2011 to join its working group on business and human rights, a body he currently chairs. Um, and I'm gonna go from there to um, our next speaker, Marcio Bahia, who was born in Belém, Pará in the Brazilian Amazon region. He earned his undergraduate degree from the Federal University of Minas Gerais and his master's and PhD from the University of Ottawa. Professor Bahia specializes in Brazilian literary and cultural studies, and more particularly, his current research focuses on the Techno Braga music scene. Um, Techno Braga, a musical genre that splices large original work from pop with popular culture, popular music. He also teaches courses in Portuguese language and Brazilian literature, culture and society such as Brazil beyond stereotypes. So um, thank you for joining us. And then our third participant is Deandra Cadet, uh, who served as the executive director of Inter Interaction Initiative um, since she founded it 20, at 22 years old in 2015 and as a student activist. She completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Notre Dame in 2015 after creating the Show Some Skin program that is still flourishing on campus. Through her work at Interaction, she's facilitated racial justice 
education programs for young people of color and their allies across the country. She was named a Dalai Lama Fellow in 2018, a, a global program which recognizes young social change leaders. So she has recently moved to Chicago or within the last year, but she's engaged in racial justice and reproductive justice organizing with Black Lives Matter, South Bend and Pro-Choice South Bend. So thank all of you for agreeing to participate in this panel today and we're excited to um, engage with you. So my first question, um, every center, institute, university, corporation in the US and abroad in the wake of the pandemic and then in particular in George Floyd's murder earlier this summer has been compelled to begin to examine and to discuss racial issues and how Black Lives Matter, even if they haven't done so before. In this case, and in our case, Notre Dame's International has begun a new virtual series focused on global challenges during the pandemic and beyond. The first seminar last month discussed social distancing in Kenya, pardon me, in Brazil, Italy, and Kenya. Today's seminar explores race and building communities of belonging perspectives of the US, the UK, and Brazil. Our panelists today come from three different um, nation states, but each brings additional complexities to our virtual table, which we look forward to hearing them explain and discuss. I'm going to ask them to begin today, both to introduce themselves <clears throat> in a bit more detail, but also to help our audience understand their perspectives of and on race in their home, quote unquote, home country as the coronavirus has advanced. So Deandra and Deandra is gonna begin first and then Marcio and then Michael, you each have about two to three minutes to explain your whole life. <laughs> so I'll ask uh, Deandra, I'll ask you to begin. Hello, thank you, Diane, for the introduction and setting us up. Um, I'm very grateful to be on this panel and to share in this conversation today. Um, so yes, my name is Deandra Cadet. I use she, her pronouns, and I am calling in from Chicago, Illinois. I am a Notre Dame alum in political science and peace studies, and I identify as a black, a first generation black Haitian American woman from Newark, New Jersey. And I currently serve as the executive director and co-founder of Interaction um, that I've served as since 2015. Interaction is an organization that is led by and for young people of color to cultivate and advance young BIPOC, Black Indigenous POC, and their counter narratives to build more inclusive, just, and equitable communities. And I believe we can't talk about race and belonging without acknowledging racism as a system of power that systemically marginalizes and disadvantages communities of color while prioritizing whiteness and white people through immunities, benefits, and advantages. For us at Interaction, in order to build communities of belonging, we must dismantle dominant narratives, stories that are told by those in power, that are around us, that are rooted in white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy, which perpetuate violence, otherness, hatred, and injustice. I'm really, Grateful to be engaging in this conversation today because it provides me with an opportunity to be reflective of the last two months. For me, May and June that of 2020 felt very much like the summer of 2014 when I was an undergraduate student at Notre Dame. It was the height of the Ferguson protests and Black Lives Matter. And I experienced the same type of collective grief in response to anti-Blackness that I have been experiencing over these last few months. However, this time I experienced it more intensely as Black people and allies that I've been fighting for were simultaneously fighting for their right to live in response to George Floyd um, and while also fighting within a pandemic that disproportionately kills them due to systemic racism and capitalism. What happened to George Floyd is not new to Black people and those that are working in racial justice. We remember Ahmed, Brianna, Nina, Vanessa, and Tony, all who died due to the same systems of violence within the last month. What I am aware of right now, even though this is not new, 
is that right now we have an immense opportunity to push for the bold policies that actually build the communities of belonging that we all deserve. It's potentially due to the pandemic, due to our presidency, due to our political climate. But I do believe that we're living in a very critical time, that we're living in what they're saying as the largest civil rights movement in our history again. There have been over 4,000 protests within the last two months in the United States and possibly more. And that I believe that right now we have a critical time and a, a huge opportunity to push for policies that actually build um, communities in which all people, especially Black, Indigenous, POC, queer, trans, disabled, undocumented, elderly, chronically ill, homeless, are safe, heard, valued, and able to thrive. So thank you. That's my push out for this. <laughs> thank you. So uh, our next speaker is Marcia. Thank you, Diane. I'm so very happy to be here with you guys. I told Father Bob that I woke up at 5 o'clock, 5 a.m. because I was so excited. <laughs> I couldn't sleep any longer. Um, uh, I am, my, uh, my talk is going to be informed by my experience in Notre Dame, especially on two fronts. Uh, one, um, teaching um, culture and society uh, courses at Notre Dame. And this is a demand from the students the students in Notre Dame um, were very interested in learning more about Brazilian society. So if we've, we've uh, taught classes on race and social equality in Brazil, Brazil giant of the South, which is like an overview of uh, a political overview um, of Brazil since the military dictatorship, Brazil beyond stereotypes in which we use like the Amazon, food, soccer, um, Rio to go deep into social issues in Brazil and they have been very successful. And also um, it's informed by the wonderful uh, network um, that I have established with the Brazilian activists uh, on race issues in Brazil and NGOs uh, through our um, summer program uh, that Notre Dame International offers every summer in Brazil. Um, so, um, um, uh, also, in addition to talking about, uh, you know, the Afro-Brazilian issue, I'd like to use this space to bring to the table another human rights crisis that unfortunately hasn't received nearly enough attention from Brazil's public opinion, let alone from international media outlets, which is the struggles and the fight to exist of indigenous populations in Brazil. So I was so happy when Dendra did include, you know, um, the indigenous minorities uh, in her talk. Um, and it's, it's, I, I am really shocked how, like, not even in Brazil, that is, uh, you know, discussed as it should be. So last year when there was, like, all those, uh, the, those outcry about uh, deforestation in the Amazon, the human um, aspect, the human dimension of the crisis was nearly touched, as if the deforestation was not intrinsically connected with the human drama that's happening in the Amazon. And why am I bringing this to this, uh, to this uh, round top table? Um, well, in sheer numbers, the indigenous population is small. It's about 800,000, 850,000 uh, people in Brazil, 0.4% uh, of the Brazilian populations, whereas the black population in Brazil is about 55% of the population. So you can see like the big difference there, right? So the eclipsing, especially in this George Floyd moment is understandable. Um, uh, but, however, the symbolic importance of these populations, almost completely wiped out, uh, wiped out by centers of ethnic cleansing, cannot be overstated. Um, it's hard to talk about communities of belonging when it comes to these native populations, since the fight is much more basic and urgent, which is the right to exist, the right to live. That's why it makes sense, I guess, to talk about the indigenous population in Brazil, within the Black Lives Matter um, discussion, because uh, you know, there's a real fight for indigenous lives matter and those people are dying uh, in those pandemics disproportionately too. Um, so um, I have like here more, uh, more information about it. And of course, we're gonna talk about um, um, you know, the Afro-Brazilian issues, but I guess it makes sense um, to also extend in the Brazilian case um, to the struggles um, and the human rights crisis that are happening all over Brazil, especially in the Amazon, where I come from. Thank you, Marcio. 
Our next speaker is Michael Adu. Well, thank you very much, Diane, and thank you to Father Bob for the very kind invitation to, to join this panel. Um, I come to this as an immigrant uh, and the connection, the link between immigration and race. Um, as Diane quite rightly pointed out, um, I originally come from Ghana and for over 35 years, uh, the UK has been my home. My experience of race therefore is very multidimensional and multi-layered. Uh, as an African, a complete adult before I came to the UK, I have a completely totally different experience uh, in that continent and then a, an entirely different um, understanding of race in the UK. Uh, but more interesting beyond the personal is the professional, having spent nearly all my life sort of following a career in human rights. And more recently, my career uh, involving the work with the United Nations, essentially uh, on the last count and including short visits, I think I've pretty much touched 80 countries uh, over the last uh, eight years. And I have seen um, certain commonalities on race, uh, including the fact that some of the challenges that we face, even though they're fairly common, are not inevitable. In other words, some of these challenges are problems that we have generated for ourselves. Now, as part of my life in the United Kingdom too, I've had the benefit of living in a very rural part of the United Kingdom in Exeter, uh, probably one of the largest counties there is in the country and pretty far away from the nearest urban, urban area. And then of course, recently um, having taken up the ordained job, which is actually based in London, I've had to experience firsthand life in, 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 in the city. So in many ways, I've seen the rural, the difference in rates in this country, in the rural area and in the urban area. I've also seen the difference because of the work that I've done with the United Nations between how public institutions handle the question of race and how private institutions handle race, um, which actually shows quite some interesting dynamic between who really leads uh, and who drives and who can actually uh, bring change. So of course, uh, the contribution that I bring is both personal in terms of a, a lived experience and professional in terms of researching, writing and practicing um, uh, in human rights, of which I should say race is part. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all three of our speakers, I would, my own interest in this come from having grown up in Washington DC and um, moved around the country a bit. Um, I've been interested in race in the US, but also race in Brazil, but I, would like to have you all talk a bit more about your day-to-day -day activities, your day-to-day -day engagement um, with race and how you came to make a space for yourself, yourselves in the places where you've lived. Um, so I'm pushing you to be a bit more personal about um, your lives. And so maybe, um, I'm curious, for example, with Marcio Bahia, Professor Bahia, whether how he came to make an adjustment between Brazil and Canada and then Canada and the US. Uh, Deandra, you described yourself as a first generation um, immigrant. Your parents migrated from Haiti. Um, and Michael, from Ghana to the UK and different parts of the UK. So talk a little bit more about about those, how do you make space for yourselves? What kinds of challenges did you encounter when you migrated, when you came to the US in Marcio's and Michael's case, who's in the UK, and Deandra in terms of Newark, New Jersey, Haiti, and the definition of self? Go ahead. Well, I can start if 
Okay, I'm gonna start. Um, well, I come from the Amazon, um, and of course, racism um, is a problem all over Brazil. Um, you know, racism um, and um, you know against um, Afro Brazilians is 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 strong all over the country. But in the Amazon in the north, we are, we have other issues that are you know concurrent, like the indigenous um, issues that I was um, um, talking about. Um, after that, I went to Canada. Uh, for my for my um, my graduate studies, and after that, my first job in the United States was in uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and uh, going to the South, I really went when I really when I went to the you know to Nashville, Tennessee. I really thought of the United States as you know a post-racial um, country. I really thought you know that racism was in the movies that I watched, that I grew up watching about 1960s, about the civil rights movement. I, I was really shocked by, um, and in a privileged space, right, how uh, my Black students um, suffered um, racism, um, even like in a privileged position, right, being a, um, a Vanderbilt student. Uh, I guess that, make, that the experience of mine in the south of Brazil in the south of the United States helped me understand my country better because uh, you know having lived in the Amazon um, I was I was I, I was not at the epicenter of the let's say that the at the Afro Brazilian issues um, so and then coming to coming to Notre Dame um, it was another step in you know get involved with with race issues because of uh, because of how important how prominent this is and how uh, our students are interested in discussing uh, these issues. So in the last couple of years I've been diving into um, in those issues and also getting to know in Brazil another side of the another side um, of the fight against racism that does not make the news, which are the people who are on the ground, the activists, um, the people who, who run NGOs, who do a wonderful job who tried to fight, you know, a far right administration with all the resources they have, and who, um, who unfortunately uh, do not have the visibility to not make the news. Um, so when I take my students there, it is great to, um, you know, to show my students how Brazil is fighting uh, racism um, through civil society movements. When you go to Brazil, where do you go? It's uh, Brazil in São Paulo. We're in Rio and Sao Paulo. Rio and Sao Paulo, okay. Yes, yes. All right. But of course, there's a big interest for Bahia and the Amazon and, uh, you know, possible mm -hmm. projects, uh, again, with NDI. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you. So maybe Michael next. Yes. Well, it's quite interesting and quite interesting hearing about uh, Marcia's uh, kind of rural background, which is fairly similar to mine. And I always sort of reflect on the accidental involvement in human rights as far as I'm concerned. Um, in the African context, you often hear that the question of race is not relevant, which of course, it's untrue. Uh, we have an entirely different label. Uh, in the African context, we put the question of tribe uh, on, on what essentially is race. It raises the same issues of this, uh, disadvantage um, between uh, different, different communities. Um, now, growing up in Ghana and trying to qualify professionally, uh, there is a requirement that every um, professional must undertake national service and you get posted to places of public service without choice. Um, I just happened to land with the prison service uh, and that happened to be a complete life changer because what I saw and the work that I did there really caused quite a lot of distress. And so going back to finish up my professional studies, I came with a lot of questions. Uh, and I know the same feeling today when students come to me with equally difficult questions. Uh, and my then advisor at uh, professional studies told me, well, they couldn't answer some of the questions. You may as well want to go and take graduate studies. Uh, and see if you can get some answers to this. And so the suggestion that I will go and do graduate studies in human rights, because basically some of the issues that arose for me in my national service were essentially human rights issues. Um, 
and that took me into the UK um, to study. Now, of course, you come into the UK with great idealism and expecting to see um, sophistication and excitement, but then you very quickly realize the culture is different. Uh, the very British reserve culture um, is a culture of exclusion, and it's almost impossible to be integrated, uh, even though that's what's encouraged. So that's probably for me the very first encounter of otherness and being, you know, essentially un unwanted. Unwanted as an immigrant, because unlike other countries where immigration is encouraged, the UK didn't encourage. So regardless of who you are, uh, as a student or whatever it is, you, you will have that uh, experience. But more to the point that the British have a completely different relationship within their communities. Um, and so to give you an illustration, um, I'm speaking from a house that I've lived in for since my second daughter was born, so it must be 26 years. And I live in a village of about 25 households. And I say this with great shame, but true, that I know two of my neighbors. It's not untypical, it's not uncommon, it's a very British way of living. I've lived in here for 26 years, and I know my neighbor to the north, and I know my neighbor to the south. And by the way, I know my neighbor to the south, because she ended up being my PA when I went to work as the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies. We'd lived together for so long and I had never realized from the point. It's a very interesting thing. So as a, as, a, as a rural kind of lifestyle, you find isolation is a key, key challenge. Uh, but of course, London is an entirely different community. And again, part of the interesting uh, uh, relationships for um, immigrants, particularly black people in rural areas is what you do with little things like food, hairdressing, and, and sharing common relations. Uh, and in my case, uh, I have to travel to London to get my hair done. It costs more to travel to get your hair done than the cost of the haircut itself. But these are fairly common, common lifestyles uh, uh, in London. And I, I've watched from a distance um, a lot of the race crisis in the urban areas, in places in, in London, uh, riots in, in the 80s, riots in the 90s, arising from, you know, relations with the police or, or, or other forms of um, race uh, confrontations, um, which often spill over into consequences for those of you who live in the rural areas, uh, because you're all seen with the same suspicion. And these become very interesting challenges. I've also seen clearly how politicians have leveraged these issues into getting into power. Uh, and I recall particularly Mrs. Thatcher and her law and order campaign, essentially the criminalization of black people, uh, and more recently, uh, David Cameron and the criminalization of Muslims. It's a very common uh, political strategy for, for gaining power, and it's a very British thing. Having said that, there have been quite some interesting um, progressive developments in the UK that I hope we'll have a chance to reflect on. And, and so that I'd, I'd like to sort of leave that for as a personal experience for the moment. Thank you very much. Um, I muted myself, sorry. Um, a very interesting set of discuss discussion points um, and we look forward to hearing more. So I'll turn uh, next to um, Deandra today. Yes, thank you, Diane. Um, and thank you both for sharing more personally about your lived experiences. Um, as I shared, the work that I do at Interaction is specifically around storytelling. So <laughs> I feel like Diane, you kind of gave me like the, like, oh, I just did work, thank you. <laughs> um, and the type of storytelling that we do at Interaction is called counter narrative storytelling. And more recently, one of my teammates um, described from her experience that for her counter narrative storytelling is in is like is an honest um, expression of the ways in which communities of color are interacting with systems of oppression or marginalized people are interacting with systems of oppression. And so I say that because 
um, systems of oppression are kind of like the water that we're swimming in. And so my, uh, so the dominant narrative is also the water that we're swimming in. It's all around us. It's in mainstream media. It's in the news. It's how we grew up. I grew up in a family, um, I am first generation Haitian American, so I was born in the States and I grew up in a family that didn't talk about race, right? We talked about it, but we didn't talk about it, right? So, and, and it, Diane's like, <laughs> it's like, hmm, what does that really mean, right? We weren't explicit in talking about how what we were experiencing is tied to systems, institutions, policies, laws, cultural norms, right? Uh, it was just the way that things were, right? So I went to a Catholic school growing up that was a very diverse Catholic school, right? Colorblind rhetoric. Um, but there was no sort of um, education or even naming around the fact that I lived in a predominantly black neighborhood and all of my friends lived in predominantly, and my other friends lived in either predominantly white neighborhoods or predominantly, you know, Asian neighborhoods and Latino neighborhoods, right? Like segregation, modern day segregation was not discussed about our experience. We just came to a diverse school um, and the rest was kind of, you know, not discussed, right? Um, and so for me, in terms of sharing counter narratives and sharing our personal stories, a lot of it took me under going back and understanding like the ways, what systems actually created my reality um, that I didn't fully understand. So going back to my own parents um, is also a narrative of anti-blackness, right? My parents is anti-blackness, is neo neo colonization, right? My parents are Haitian immigrants to this country. And yes, the narrative could be shared that they came for a better life, for education. Um, but it was also a time of, you know, for me, I think back to why Haiti is in a position in which um, we have Haitian immigrants coming to the United States during the 1970s. And I think about the century of anti-Blackness um, that contributed to um, Haiti being the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, even though they are the first Black Republic on the Western Hemisphere as well, right? Um, that, you know, Haiti paying France, you know, 150 million francs for a century because um, France lost their successful slave revolt, right? Um, the fact that um, Haiti was not recognized as an independent country, even by the United States that really affected their trade and the ability to become, um, to build their economy for centuries, right? Um, the fact that in 2012, uh, during the Haiti earthquake, which for me, my relationship to Haiti is, is very nuanced. <laughs> um, and the fact that I've, I've never been back, I've only been back once and that was through Notre Dame and it was a very difficult experience for me because it was without my family. It was the only way I could afford it, right? Uh, to go back to the country of my parents was to go with Notre Dame money. Um, and I went without my family, um, which was very difficult for me. Uh, and it was after the earthquake, which I saw um, how aid can also be incredibly anti-Black, um, how funds and resources that were meant to build up and rebuild Haiti were very little <laughs> given into the hands of Black people um, and Haitian people. And so um, these are my kind of understandings and experiences of the reality and seeing it and operating first under these narratives of, of oh, economic, you know, my parents coming to the States for education, or um, Haiti, you know, is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere because it just is, <laughs> um, or all these narratives that I just had, but then being able to have the tools to question them and to be actually go in deeper and actually learn history um, about what is really going on um, really helped me to understand how I'm not like what it means to move through the world as a black woman, um, what it means to, how the world is interacting with me. And, um, and I think also my, my time at Notre Dame definitely contributed to that. Um, what does it mean to, to essentially be a part of an institution that was not built for you, right? Um, that is not built with you in mind, that was not, you know, intentionally built for you in its inception, right? And, and what does that legacy look like? Even if you are creating reforms and policies to, 
to um, respond to the growing diversity of, of students on campus. Um, but, but really seeing how um, power and, and capitalism and, and racism are so entrenched in our systems and our institutions and what that looks like on the ground. Um, and which is why you see so many, and even as I graduated, I would have students from Notre Dame reaching out to me, students of color, asking me how I do it, asking me how they can do it, asking me how do they navigate this space. And it was really, I was that support person. My whole team was that support person because we lived in South Bend. And so, um, you know, we had to really support them in, in sharing that they're not crazy, that their experiences are real and true. Um, and that yes, racism does exist at Notre Dame, um, even if like we're not explicit about it. Um, and so that's really, um, really how I've come to know and understand um, like my experiences with racism because sometimes it's not that interpersonal experience that I have that shuts me, that like shoots you off, right? Um, it's, it's about really understanding the world in which we live in and gaining true history and true understanding, um, gaining the full story, understanding those counter narratives around us. Um, and I'm really thankful for Marcia for really bringing in the, you know, the indigenous um, narrative because I'm really starting to understand, I see my own family's narrative of, of, you know, choosing to come to the United States as that only path, but also that path of what I'm understanding of still contributing to the continuous colonization of Native people's land, which is the United States is, is stolen land, right? And so I participate in it, my parents participated in it. And that doesn't make us like, quote unquote, bad people, but it's understanding the, what we're participating in in this world um, and in this society. And so I think that awareness, because we do have choice, right? I think capitalism, racism, patriarchy makes us believe that we have no choices, um, but really there are a plethora of choices that we do have, but you just have to understand what's being fed to you, so. Oh, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I want to say one little thing and then I'll let the other speakers chime in. You might have heard the, the mention of reparations um, that uh, Deandra mentioned and what she was saying and what she said, but I want to make sure the audience heard and understood her, is that Haiti paid reparations to France for a century. And I'm not sure that they're not still paying it. Um, you know, the poverty in Haiti, and I've been, I happen to have had a chance to go to Haiti when I was a grad student at the University of Chicago. And it, it is a challenging visit. Um, but I did not know until maybe 20 years ago about the fact that Haiti was paying reparations to France. France demanded it and was able to gather that for a century. So just wanted to make sure everybody heard that. So comments, uh, join in, Marcio, Michael, please. If I could say um, something very, related to this question of reparations. I think the subject of reparations is not new, particularly for um, wider questions of slavery and, de and colonization. Um, and for years, this has been rejected and swept under the carpet. Far more recently, the narrative is changing. Um, it's changing because we are increasingly, certainly in, in certain contexts, seeing the acknowledgement of the harm done by colonialism and slavery. Now, I'm only picking on a very interesting example that's fairly recent, the state of Qatar. And often when we talk about slavery, I think the attention is on the transatlantic slave trade, which of course was a huge um, event. But there was before then Arabic slave trade between the Middle East and Africa. And of course, this is often not acknowledged and this is not often discussed, but Qatar recently set up a slave museum in which a lot of the artifacts 
um, came from Africa and within. And in that country, there is some discussion of an assessment of the damage that has been done. Uh, now, it's not any indication or any confirmation that there will be reparations. But the point I'm making is that the conversation is no longer taboo. Uh, the subject has been done, uh, it's been discussed about how much can we ever think of how much harm it is. Uh, forget about whether we'll pay it or not, but at least the subject is out. Um, within the context of the United Nations, um, there was a, a conference in South Africa, the Durban Conference, um, which re on rates, which really did not survive um, at all because of this question of reparations. Um, having said that, um, the Durban uh, discussions have not gone away and the conversation has remained around the issues of race and reparations. In other words, within the context of the United Nations, the subject persists. And so um, gradually it's going to become an interest. And I have this very strange idea that what if, just out of argument sake, what if Qatar in now stepping up and perhaps if for no other reason, but except for the fact that they think they can afford it, makes the first step in offering some reparation for slavery. Where will the narrative be for the rest of Europe and America on that? In effect, what I'm saying is that it is not a lost cause. I think this question about reparation is, is worth continuing the discussion because the doors are opening and it will come. Now, and I should say one other thing very quickly. Uh, just before um, we got together, I think Father Bob had put together some thoughts, and I suspect we will come round to this. And, and the question, of course, is what will be the role of the church and the institution, um, uh, the Notre Dame University? And I think there I have this idea that there is pain, and there is pain that the church can help heal. And reparations is probably one of the ways of healing that pain. And if, if, if the church can actually have uh, a role to play, first, in its tradition of reconciliation, it really has to encourage confession and through that healing. And that's the role that I imagine the university, and I, when we get around to talking about the university, the university has always played this leading role um, in civil rights. Uh, and before I came to Notre Dame, and before I knew very much about Notre Dame, I'd heard about Ted Hersberg. And in those days, it was a question, who on earth is this guy whose name keeps coming up whenever you... Now I, I get the picture of who this person, Ted Hersberg, is, partly because of what he stood for and how he fought for it. And I think there's a legacy that this university has of leadership in healing that it can do. And I think that's a role that this university can, can play uh, through uh, uh, working out towards healing. Yeah, yeah, and as for Brazil, I wish I could say that um, our country has advanced in that conversation, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the problem is before that. It's as, like I said, like in my, at the beginning of my talk, is the fight is for the right to exist, like for basic, uh, for for the basic human right to exist. So because of that, the discussion in Brazil is dominated by issues like a police brutality, brutality which is um, much worse in the United States. And we can talk about that, about that later. Um, and even, you know, the kind of uh, leveling the playing field that we've made progress in the last decades has suffered like setbacks, you know, that is a progress and retrenchment. So for example, affirmative action in Brazil uh, in the early 2000s, we had like very interesting experiments in Brazil um, that were successful, but then the system tries to retrench and tries to undo those, that, that, you know, those progress that were made. Um, but fortunately, again, we have people fighting in politics, in the um, civil society, on, on organizations fighting against it. For example, we have the, uh, um, um, a coalition called Coalizão Negra por Direitos, so uh, Black Coalition for Rights, uh, which is a bigger organization composed by several um, movements, Black movements in Brazil, uh, and they have, been, um, they have been fighting very hard 
uh, for not to have setbacks in the progress already made, like affirmative action, which is a big deal in Brazil. Thank you. Yes, much richness there with the point about reparations in terms of Haiti, uh, Michael bringing in the developments of Qatar and the United Nations, the multilateral engagement um, is often a, a venue for discussing things that are impossible to bring up within, within nation states. Uh, my first, actually my first international encounter was at the International Political Science Association meetings, which were in Brazil in um, uh, 1982. Uh, and uh, that was during the um, military uh, governance. Uh, and so it was quite a different space. And even the American political scientists who participated paid more attention to making sure that the committees and so forth were balanced in ways they would never, at that point at least, would never have done in the United States. So I found that that space, a very different space than had been the case in America, my interactions in the American environment. Um, so lots of, lots of things have come up. Uh, the role of the Catholic Church, I have to take note of the beginnings of um, efforts at reparations in our, one of our sister universities, namely Georgetown University, which um, challenged by its um, recognition of um, the use of slavery to quote unquote save the institution in the 19, in the 1880s when it sold a significant number of um, people who were enslaved in, um, in Maryland and sold them into slavery further south and in, into Louisiana. And the university has begun to bring some students back to uh, students who are descendants of the uh, people who were sold to name, rename buildings um, in honor of people who were sold. Um, so there's, a, there's something going on. I, I would argue that it's a small move since that act in 1880, 1830 something uh, was only one move and slavery in the university and the, and the Jesuits in Maryland had been in existence since the 1700s with significant plantations in Maryland and so forth. So yes, they did begin to take action, but at the same time, there wasn't a number of, there wasn't a real recognition of the several hundred years of, in which the enslaved population had been in, in under their reign before that. Uh, so there's a lot of exploration that needs to be done. And we're, you know, these are universities. One of the things we're working on at the moment in Africana Studies and a new center on race that the Dean Mastillo is, is helping us to create, Mark Sanders is involved in this, is to look for a historian of slavery. Whether it's in the US or in the Americas, we'll see what the pool brings to us, but we're working on that at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you all have other comments. We have some questions beginning to have questions in our chat. I think Deandra may want to say something, please. Yeah, I think <clears throat> one thing that I was also thinking of um, in terms of what Michael was sharing, um, one about healing and intergenerational trauma. So really um, taking note that um, not only is it healing from the past, but also understanding that um, descendants not only of slavery, but also um, Right, descendants of indigenous people, descendants of colonial genocide um, are experiencing intergenerational trauma and, and what does that look like um, present day? Um, so I feel like that needs to be taken into account within a healing or reconciliation process, whatever that might look like. I also think connecting current day um, institutions that are derivative of slavery and genocide and really questioning those, um, I'm thinking of the institution of police and policing, um, and that being a derivative of slavery and a modern, and as well as prisons. Um, and how does that tie into reparations of, of um, really eliminating modern day structures of slavery and control? 
um, and how can that tie into reparations? Um, and lastly, as well as, as I was thinking about Mount Rushmore today <laughs> um, and how um, indigenous communities are still fighting for land that is due to them, including Mount Rushmore, which is part of the Black Hills, um, which is part of, which is supposed to be a part of the Great Sea Reservation, but the US has gone against that treaty knowingly um, when it is indigenous land. And so, what does it mean for reparations of just actually <laughs> being due what is due to you? Um, and so, ha yeah, so just thinking about those things that are very present in modern day um, and seeing those as a part of, as a continuation of things that happened in the past but are very much present in the future and that they are essentially the same thing but in a different tone, right? And in just a different model. Um, so really making sure that we're, we're doing that in whatever processes that we're looking for. So I think there's a lot of connections there. And I'm also thinking about our response to COVID um, and how much that's changed the conversation around fair wages, right? The stimulus package, right? We saw the government suddenly, like, I know I was shocked. I was like, wait, so we can just print money <laughs> and we can just give people $1,200 like what, like why have we not been doing this, right? And so I think the question of reparations and like funding and what can be brought back into communities to reinvest in communities um, is very possible if, if during a literal crisis, you know, why is it that in a crisis where people are dying at disproportionate rates, we were dying before then too. <laughs> so can we also think about how do we use those same systems in a response to crisis to also continue for fair wages, like hazard pay, healthcare, right? This should really tell us about how we get full healthcare for everybody, especially in COVID. So um, those are just some of the questions that I'm thinking about and that connect to reparations. All of it to me is. Great. Uh, Diane, we have a few questions that are coming in, as you mentioned. Please. And uh, Please. One, one interesting question is, is from someone who, who, who says, I was born white and grew up in a relatively racially diverse area. And I've just bought the book, White Fragility, and I will read it. And I, but I'm really interested in hearing the panelists' perspectives on concrete actions that I can take to make a difference and an impact on improving racial understanding, inclusivity, and justice. So that's the question from uh, one of our participants today. Thank you. If anyone's ready to jump in. Um, I don't think question. there's a universal formula for individual contributions. I like this, a question each one of us has to ask, like what can I do in my world um, to be anti-racist, -ra right? Um, rather than simply being a non-racist, to paraphrase Angela Davis. Um, I guess in my case, as a university professor working um, for an institution embedded in privilege with like students who are uh, embedded in privilege, I try to promote the debate through a Brazilian perspective, right? So I try to offer courses that promote the debates on race issues in Brazil, as I've said before, um, in the classroom, you know, um, with my students, I remind them with, of the realities and responsibilities of white privilege. Uh, you know, it's so easy to forget them when you are inside it, when you are embedded, when the world is, um, uh, makes you not see it. Um, uh, and I, right now, I'm in a process, of, in a process to decolonize my syllabus uh, by studying introducing uh, Black Brazilian authors, uh, classic and contemporary ones, so Abidjan Nascimento, Silvio Almeida, who is a fantastic, fantastic scholar, uh, Jamila Ribeiro, who has been very influential in Brazil now. Um, I am dying to read uh, the book by Professor um, Gladys Mitchell Walter, uh, who is going to be a panelist for um, uh, our, our roundtable next week, the Do Black um, Lives Matter in Brazil. Um, and she's, she's actually on our, she's in the audience today. I'm happy this to is here, Gladys. Shout out to Gladys. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Um, Gladys is a big um, uh, leadership. Um, she understands very much about affirmative action in Brazil. I'm really dying to hear her um, talking to us. 
uh, next week. She was the president of the Brazilian Studies Association. So, you know, uh, th those people, they bring, uh, I, was, I was really shocked, um, you know, in the past, in the, in my, in the first versions of uh, my course, for example, on race and social equality in Brazil, how not diverse my corpus was. How I was bringing, uh, how I was discussing like uh, Gilberto Freire, which of course is important in Brazil from the 1930s, but how like there's so much uh, black intellectuals, you know, minority intellectuals, indigenous intellectuals, and this is a, a work in progress because my syllabus has no indigenous intellectuals at all, and they are there, and they have a lot of a contribution um, to us. Um, so this is a work in, this is a work in progress. Um, it's not nearly enough, um, but those are like immediate actions that I think I can take as a university professor in Brazilian studies. Um, and each one has to find their own strategies to address this question, I believe. And can I just ask, and I could be speculated in this, the question that sounds like a young person, I could be wrong, <laughs> because uh, the question is more what they can do. And I will only tell them my advice on that account. And I think for me, the, the biggest hope there is that I can see is in our young people and in our, in the next generation. And I'm not writing off my generation, but I'm actually thinking um, the younger generation have a better option. One, a better option of getting to know the reality, often through social media by far, than through organized press. Um, a lot of them probably have had better interactions through activities of travel, um, through sport, to have come across people from other races. Um, and so they have a better opportunity. Now, the question is, have they, will they, can they leverage these connections? And that raises the question more importantly of what values do they stand for? So you may very well be on social media and ignore everything. You may be traveling very well and still be isolated. But if you think, if you have some very core values of humanity, fairness and equality, different things that you see on your travels, different things that you read on the social media will mean different things to you. And often it will make you proactive or maybe not. So that's the idea that if you have some very core values of what you stand for, you will be proactive when you need to be and you will do what you have to do rather than to let somebody tell you what to do. So I don't have to tell them to go out and seek black people or minorities, ask them how they really feel because instinctively they would like to know some more and do what they need to do. Um, so I think, you know, younger people have a better opportunity. Now, I'm not suggesting that we, the older folks, have, have no chance, but we are far more entrenched in our mindsets. We have bought houses in places we are very concerned about values. We have invested in professional careers that we think matter more than the people. We are not interested in getting to know or change the environments in which we operate. And so we are far less able to do this. And I could be completely wrong about this um, because I know and I've worked with very dynamic, you know, older people uh, who have been far more progressive. And I think those are often in the minority. They're not in the majority. Whereas I think for younger people, there's a better chance that there will be a, a, a force behind numbers with them. Great, well, we have a, a few other questions. Um, Can I just compliment on, on that yeah. uh, very yeah. quickly? There's a comment here in the chat saying, why What Fragility is an important book. It's vital that we read black authors and other minority scholars. It's from Bri 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 Kim. Yeah, um, yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Hashtag cite black scholars. Um, I do agree with that. In the case of Brazil, for example, in literature, we've had wonderful, wonderful women um, black women have done like wonderful uh, literary works. Uh, we have like the contemporary uh, Conceição Evaristo, who has become a big star in Brazil. Uh, we have um, uh, we have um, you know more traditional 
of black uh, women writers like Carolina Maria de Jesus, who is also very important, who ha has become like canonic in Brazilian literary studies. But this is still like a work in progress. Just like a few years ago, like it was very hard to have access to it. Now it's a real movement. So let's read minorities. Let's decolonize our, th our thoughts, our syllabi, um, and our university discussions and beyond. I'm, I'm reading very slowly a wonderful book by the sociologist um, Alden Morris about um, a, a book of his called The Scholar Denied about uh, ex exploration of W.B. Du Bois and how the field of sociology really did not pay attention to his work when in fact Du Bois was the founder of sociology. Um, so uh, Morris is a um, book, The Scholar Denied is, is an example of that, with Du Bois being an extraordinary scholar for the last, for the hundred years that he lived um, and who, who produced many, many, many studies um, based in the United States, but at the same time of, of great importance. So that's an example of one of, from the historical legacy of sociology, the sociology itself wouldn't acknowledge, but which our current uh, sociology a sociologist has brought into public um, knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also Diane, like um, Samantha Juarez said that in addition to reading books by black authors, consider buying from black bookstores. Um, so, you know, this sure. is another, like, you know, uh, Father Bob asked, like, what, what can we do? What practical things can we do, uh, you know, to change the structural racism uh, um, in our society? Um, so one of the things we're going to be discussing next week, we're going to have a panelist, Vitor Del Rey. He's, he's dedicated his life uh, to promote uh, Black inter in, inter enterprise in Brazil. So he's going to give us a very interesting perspective of what we can do in our everyday lives um, to, tend, to change the structure of racism. I'm sorry, I'm, sorry I'm, I'm plugging the next week's roundtable all the time, but I guess if we're interested in Brazil, it's going to be uh, really interesting. I can add one thing, I think, um, especially for white folks on the call, is definitely um, talking within your own spheres, right? Um, talking with your family members, your friends, and engaging in conversations with them. Um, because you might have more access to resources, right, by being in this space and getting more books. And, um, and the next step is to also engage with other people and continue to bring them in, um, because that's how we continue to mobilize and build more allyship. Um, because you might have more of an influence on them than I might have if they came to one of my workshops, right? We don't have that relationship. We don't have that trust. And so um, really building, really engaging more people with people you have relationships with in that difficult dialogue about race and, and challenging one another and bringing them forward is going to be more effective for the movement overall. Um, and also just as um, Marcio said, like understanding your sphere of influence, right? If, if you are a person wherever you work, wherever your neighborhood is, like thinking about all aspects of life and how you can be anti-racist within that. Because um, it looks like anything from what you buy, uh, what, how you create your syllabus, right? Where you live, how you're participating in gentrification, if so, right? Um, like who you vote for, like all these aspects, who you, who your friends are, right? If you see your community is, is mostly looks like you, um, that also means that your life is pretty, can be segregated. And so how are you continuously putting yourself in spaces where you're building relationships with people who don't look like you so that you have a stake in their lives, right? I think that's what segregation does is that, um, it, like we see it with white flight, it, it makes us not have stake in each other's liberation. And so by having relationships with people, you have more of a stake in their, in their life and their struggle. Um, and so that's really, that's something that um, I think you can think about as well. Other back? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, back to this uh, question and someone else has raised this question in our chat box. Um, what, what more could Notre Dame be doing? Um, not only to make Notre Dame itself, what more could, could the university be doing to make itself a, a community of belonging? Um, but what, what more could Notre Dame be doing um, for the wider society uh, as a Catholic research university? Well, I want to share a story, like a personal story that my, you know, 
bring light to that. Um, um, last year, um, some friends, um, her daughter, her brilliant daughter was speaking like universities um, to study. Um, she was brilliant. She had been, she, has, she was visiting uh, Notre Dame, um, Stanford, um, UCLA and other like top universities and, and they came to Notre Dame. As a proud member of um, uh, Notre Dame um, community, I, I, you know, I showed them around. It was one of those events for, um, you know, families interested in, in bringing their children to Notre Dame. Um, and we had a wonderful day and it was like very happy. It was like, oh, we, we, they were very impressed with us. Um, and then um, she picked up to go somewhere else. Um, and then I talked to my friend, to her, um, to her father. Um, and it was so interesting. I asked him, um, why did she choose um, somewhere else? And he said, uh, uh, Marcia, she loved Notre Dame. She loved the way she was treated, uh, but she was, uh, she was shocked by the lack of diversity she saw. She did not think that that represented the 21st century world she wanna be part of. That was shocking to me. That was like, wow. Um, I think that, um, you know, our community needs to, you know, to, again, to paraphrase uh, Angela Davis, it's not enough not to be, uh, not to be, not to be racist, to have to be anti-racist. We don't, you cannot simply have a, a policy of, uh, you know, accepting the students of, of who don't have financial, who, who have financial needs. You have to be proactive in attracting them um, to the university. So I guess we still have a long, 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 long work to do um, in terms of diversity, uh, you know, to, uh, to make, you know, minorities who come to Notre Dame feel like that place was not maybe originally made for them, but now in the 21st century, it's made for them. Right. Can I just join the conversation? I know that I preempted this conversation talking about healing, um, and I don't want to belabor um, the point, but I, I want to perhaps emphasize the importance of conversation as part of healing. And Notre Dame, with its gateways, um, NDI is like a perfect vehicle for encouraging global conversations about this. And I think, Father Bob, this particular event is typical, but I'm actually thinking when COVID is over, uh, we could have in-person events at all our gateways with particular themes around race uh, in Brazil, in Chile, in London, because we can, because we have the facilities. But that's not all. We also have the faith that goes with it. We have reason to be credible. And I think as a university, we should be able to take advantage of our faith position as a faith institution to justify why we think we should be the ones driving this. But above everything else is the leadership. I mean, the little that I've seen of Notre Dame as a university is it tends to strike out. Um, Notre Dame was probably one of the first institutions to strike out wanting to have um, in-person teaching and being prepared for it and others will follow. And I think Notre Dame seems to be one of those institutions that will do what it thinks it's right rather than just following the crowd. And I think we need to build upon that leadership position, leverage our gateways, build up upon our faith, and bring everybody with us. Um, it's not going to happen unless we really stand for it and push for it. We can if we want to. I'd like to share. I think my perspective might be a little different. I think um, I'm just seeing what Bright is saying about hiring Black students and, and other um, minorities for office jobs is a step in the right direction. And I feel that if Notre Dame are to have like a national, right, leadership role in advancing racial justice, it needs to start at home, right? It needs to really, if you wanna be a national, international um, pillar for this, um, you need to start at home because there are too many students of color that are struggling and there are too many faculty and staff of color that are also struggling, right? There are a lot of staff turnover over community of uh, staff and faculty of color at Notre Dame that um, I've seen, right? Um, I think investing in racial justice 
uh, departments like Africana studies departments and scholars that can actually right actually be the leaders of this you need to invest in that and you need to invest in in what healing justice is you need to invest in um, of, of scholars that are actually have these lived experiences um, in order to 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 move forward in that way and so I know for myself um, as an alum I've been pretty disappointed in the choices that in Notre Dame has made on an inter, on a national stage I'll name um, I'll be pretty political. I'll name Mike Pence coming as, as a commencement speaker. Um, I remember that very viciously, very uh, viscerally, right? Um, those are, that's on a national stage. And so I think that um, in order to be a national model for racial justice, you have to start at home and you have to make those hard decisions. As Michael said, choosing to stand out Right. And I think um, there are plenty of opportunities that Notre Dame could have done that in the past and plenty of more opportunities that it could do moving forward. Um, so I think there's yes, that's that's definitely uh, my perspective on on where it should begin. Thank you. Thank you, Deandra. There's really a lot to be said. Um, my and also in response to Michael's comments about um, uh, leveraging the gateways and uh, building and fostering conversation and taking a leadership role as you, you said the Notre Dame was the first to stand out in terms of teaching face to face. Well, was, the faculty spent, you know, much, much time since that happened um, discussing the logic of it, the safety of it, the reality of it. I am not going to be teaching face to face because of my age and um, not serious health issues, but health issues that I have to pay attention to. And without, um, without taking into account the, what we found with the, with the pandemic, that the impact has been felt much, much more heavily on African Americans because African Americans are working face to face frequently because they may not have uh, or have access right away to um, uh, uh, health care that is uh, or, or health insurance that they can use when uh, they may encounter or they may succumb to uh, to COVID. Uh, it's important to recognize the complexity of the situation mm -hmm. and the university's decision to teach face to face is something that is very complicated and as we've seen as we're seeing today with the ways in which it's been very difficult for um, the country to have a coherent policy about how to respond to COVID with a president who's not himself able to think about these kinds of things or to even understand the importance of them. And so we have the United States, the incidence of COVID, the deaths, we are so far above in, in a bad way. The frequency um, is now so enormous in the U.S. compared to the rest of the world um, that we can't assume that it's going to be safe to do this. Uh, the university is working carefully and intens intensively to prepare for it. We'll have to see, but we've also got to take into account the surrounding environment, what the situation is like, the number of cases, how um, <laughs> and what students will be bringing with them. So it's a very complicated set of decisions and I'm not dismissing it um, easily because it, it's clear that it's an extraordinarily complicated situation where every institution is really literally having to remake itself in order to prepare for this um, current environment. So I, I do want to just put that on the table as a context to think about. So I know there are other questions. Uh, I'll go back, let uh, Bob, uh, Bob come back with some comments or maybe one of the Panelists might want to speak. I don't know. I yeah. just uh, want to say that um, um, uh, the the chat has been like fantastic, like suggestions and comments. I don't know if Ali, you were going to be able to have access to the chat when when the meeting is over. 
Yes, so I'll, I'll save the chat when the, the meeting has finished and then um, I'll be able to compile all of the links and resources um, and send it out to all of our participants so that they can access them after. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, and I think it would be interesting to hear panelists provide examples of what they consider to be models for bringing people together. Um, particularly across um, racial distinctions or ethnic distinctions. Um, but, um, but can you point to some examples in your own experience that um, good examples uh, of bringing people together and that might, that might represent some lessons for us and help to point the way forward? Can I speak for the UK if I can? probably where I've lived longest. Um, and starting with some of the things that probably seem insignificant. Celebration, the Notting Hill Carnival in London, probably one of the few occasions when people come together. I must say it's been very gentrified recently, um, moving beyond its very simplistic idea of bringing communities together. So I don't know, I mean, celebrating having reason to celebrate together is probably um, a, good, a good reason. But also I think we need policies that are deliberately crafted to bring people together. Um, in, in the UK, as a matter of practice, I think all housing communities are mixed. So you will have a mansion next to what you call project housing. So you find therefore the people living in that neighborhood, regardless of race, regardless of wealth, are shopping in the same supermarket. Um, they're using the same parks. Um, and I think that seems to me a good way. I mean, it may, it may won't be perfect, but at least it is, it is a good strategy. For some of the old houses, uh, old neighborhoods that were increasingly segregated, technically, um, regeneration, as a strategy, it's a way of bringing together in London, Brixton, which used to be largely uh, a black neighborhood has been regenerated. And frankly, everybody wants to live in Brixton. Um, Islington was another place and it's also been regenerated. So it is quite possible to regenerate um, that. And of course, I don't mean to hold this in anybody's face, but I think the UK's healthcare system is probably one way of bringing people together um, in terms of offering it at the point of need. Uh, I don't know how other people will ever be able to get around to it. Uh, I think the UK made a pitch after the, the war and that really uh, paid well. Um, I also think being part of a community of nations is very important rather than being isolationist. Uh, and I say this knowing that we've just voted Brexit, um, which personally I regret because I think one way of bringing communities together uh, was being a member of the European Union, you have communities from Poland, from France, in this country, from Germany, and suddenly you're getting to know different ways of handling things. So if ever any country has a chance of being a community of nations, that's always a, a, a very good. Um, I'm a great fan of sports. And I think, uh, and again, depending upon how people handle it, in, in, in this country, um, sport is another one way of bringing people. Some certain, certain sports are largely um, seen as particular belonging particular races so in this in this country rugby for example it's a game played mostly by you know white people and poor but actually it's not entirely true it's fairly open but soccer on the other hand uh, is fairly open to to all races so again it could be another way in which you could use um sports cricket uh, and these are games that necessarily bring people from different nations into competition so as we speak, the West Indian cricket team is currently playing England at, in, now. And suddenly the communities come together in the pubs to support, um, by the way, because Boris has allowed us to go to pubs now. So yes, we go into the pubs to cheer our teams and so on and so on. So sports can be another one of those areas. So finally, I think education. These are central services and they have to be funded centrally. We have an education system which uh, paid from taxes, but from central government funds. Um, and 
they are not necessarily reason for having equal uh, effect because we still have our private institutions but certainly almost all our education systems are funded centrally and i think that's a great a great way of just giving people a slightly better a better chance of course those who go off to private schools will probably have slightly better luck. Um, these are some examples and i should say with a caveat thank, thank, you. thank you michael thank you thank you i think father bob wants to we're getting close to the end we're going to have to begin to wrap up but father bob you have a, another comment no, only to say, I think that uh, it's an those are excellent suggestions. I would be curious to know, you know, Deandra, what you think, uh, of, you know, how you would answer that question as well. Any kind of examples, good examples. I know your work is focused on this in a special way, you know, bringing people together, yeah. uh, building communities of belonging. And then, um, then perhaps Marcio has some, some thoughts on this as well. And then we can probably, we'll probably then need to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. right, Diane. So Deandra. Yeah, I think one example that I, I thought of um, is actually in response to the pandemic is the amount of mutual aid um, associations, mutual aid groups that formed in response to COVID-19. And so um, mutual aid is is a response to of, of community members, neighbors coming together to care for their community. And um, often in response to when systems and institutions fail, right? Um, and so what I see, and even though it's in a response to when systems fail, a lot of what I see is these mutual aid groups continuing and, and interested in lasting beyond the pandemic because many of these system failures are, are, are continuing, right? And so I think the wonderful thing, I'm part of a mutual aid group within my community. I live in a very small neighborhood. There's a ton uh, coming up in Chicago. Um, and are existing and a lot of it has to do with redistribution of wealth and resources right so it's people who have some are giving money food groceries to those who have who do not it's coming from a place of abundance rather than scarcity right which is in a direct right response to capitalism that we i might not have enough or i need to hoard right you saw people hoarding during covid all the hand sanitizer and toilet paper but in but mutual aid is like i have enough and so I'm going to give you what I, some of what I have so that you can survive this and that we can make it through. And it really comes from, um, I think, for, within mutual aid, right? I have community members that have, we call the police on their door. And for me, that's a very like non-Black Lives Matter stance. <laughs> um, but I still put the flyer in that door because I believe that if they're struggling, they still deserve care. They still, I would help them get, medicine or food if they need it right and so i think right it's it's really just trusting there's a lot of trust in what the community needs so someone's asking for 200 dollars to pay for rent we don't say oh why don't you have it because we understand the systems at place that make people not have 200 dollars for rent we know that people have multiple jobs right we know that they might have lost their job due to covid we know that they might be taking care of other people so it's a very like just like a lot of trust in community, a lot of abundance in what we have, a lot of belief that like um, that we should care for one another and we should all step up. And I think if we are coming from a place of like that sort of, as Michael said, like value system, then it really ch changes how you respond rather than like, oh, I can't do that or, or I see them as the other or, um, oh, I don't feel safe with this person, right? It just, it's like, people need things <laughs> and, and we should support them to get them to get what they need. And so um, that's, that's really something that I've seen that's been really beautiful that I think we can all really learn from. Yeah, very quickly, I just wanna um, again, talk about, you know, some of the, some of the, of some of the beauty of the community building that's going on in Brazil. I'm gonna mention two cases. Uh, one um, is an NGO called uh, Navi Capo who teaches uh, underprivileged kids music, who, who, who offers like a way out of, you know, poverty through music, through scholarships dealing with music. Uh, when I took my students, um, American students uh, to Brazil, uh, we had like a chance encounter with them. Like they were practicing in one of the schools we visited. Um, uh, Thais knows that Thais Speed is our wonderful um, um, staff from India, Brazil is smiling because she knows how magical it was. It was a magical, powerful moment in which culture, which, in which music connected 
the students from Notre Dame who spoke another language who come from, from a completely different background uh, with uh, like underprivileged kids in Brazil. That was really beautiful. Uh, but that being said, we have to remember that uh, change also comes, especially structural racism, change just comes with a uh, fight, sometimes with confrontation, sometimes with protest, sometimes with like fighting hard um, against the erosion of democracy. Um, they are not mutually exclusive, um, but I just um, I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, that are, there are different fronts in which you have um, to fight. Uh, and, you know, fighting politically, um, sometimes through confrontations, is, is, is a necessary way uh, for change. Great. Well, Diane, maybe I'll just turn it over to you and then, um, and then uh, maybe um, you could turn it back over to me and we'll wrap things up. I think we're about, we're about <laughs> yeah. Right. But, but, but again, I want to give you a chance got, for a last word. Yeah, can, we've got just a, well, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah Marcio, uh, a minute, a minute. Next week. <laughs> it's going to happen Friday on July the 24th. And I'm going to give a big shout out to our wonderful NDI Brazil team. Thais Pires, Emily Camp, um, Rafael Guerra, with the support of Father Bob and Ali here um, in South Bend. We're putting together this wonderful panel. We're going to be able to dive deeper. We can uh, put it in the chat. In Brazil. How about that? Yeah. Okay, I will put it in the chat. And also, yeah, there, let's do that. There's, there's, there's a link for you to register, just like you did for this one. Um, yeah. It's going to be very exciting. Yeah. So many, many different ways of thinking about our global interactions and ways of building community. I think we've built a lot of community here today. Um, uh, one of the communities I've in, encountered when I was in Brazil on a number of occasions, I know Gladys knows of this as well as the Stevie Biko Institute in, based in Bahia, in which students are helped to uh, pass the, um, the uh, test that they have to take in order to be able to be eligible for college. Um, founded by uh, Afro-Brazilian academics and NGOs, the same uh, points that uh, Marcio had made previously. Um, and uh, they're it, just wonderful kinds of things. One of the things I did when I was growing up was participate in so-called home visits at the Catholic Archdiocese of Washington, um, uh, initiated many decades ago in the 1950s or early 60s. I keep thinking I should try to find um, the uh, 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 records of that event, because it brought people together for, across different parishes and schools, blacks and whites, meeting in each other's homes. There are lots of problems with it, but at the same time, it, it gave people some access to each other in ways that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So we've talked about reparations, we've talked about the role of the church, we've talked about the role of, that Notre Dame can play, we've talked about ways of specific ways that each one of you th think about building communities. And I'm gonna not try to talk too long here because uh, we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna call on each one of you to make one last thank you so much comment to the audience um, uh, here. So I'll start with Michael. Well, a minute. Thank you very much, Dan, to you for being such a wonderful um, moderator. Um, I just think this kind of conversation only just began and if we can continue with this kind of regular events like this I think we'll learn more. And thank you very much to all those who put in the chat. I've been reading the chat and yes I do realize some of the fantastic ideas that we all can pull together. Thank you. I will also say thank you. Again this is very timely. Um, there was much more we could discuss, uh, but again, as Michael said, it's an ongoing conversation. Thank NEDI for putting together those conversations. I guess this is how we can, you know, make change happen in, 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 in times of COVID and social distance and isolation. And last, but hardly least. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for, for having me, Diane and, and Robert um, and Dr. Dad. Oh. Oh, father, dad. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. Um, and and yes, I'm I'm open to having more conversations with with folks that are interested in, in engaging and learning more, um, specifically around racial justice. And and we do share a lot of resources um, through interaction 
um, especially now that we're pushing out right responses to like how do we radically imagine right a, a community of belonging what does that mean where every single one of us is safe heard valued um, and so that's something that we're interested in as an organization that we're committed to especially in building a world where young BIPOC black indigenous POC thrive um, and so yes happy to connect and share but I'm very grateful thank you and Diane, I want to thank you. Thanks for moderating this discussion. Um, it's just a real pleasure to have you uh, doing this and, and working together on this. So thank you very much. Thanks to, to Michael, Marcia, Marcio, and Deandra. Um, thanks for sharing your experience and expertise. And thanks everyone who's joined us. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, and as Michael said, as we've all sort of recognized, this is the the beginning of a conversation it's not it's not the end and so we look forward to continuing the conversation and ultimately finally it's about human dignity right it's ultimately finally about finding ways to help people to grow an awareness of their own dignity and respect for the dignity of others and i think that's at the root of the mission of notre dame so thanks thanks for joining us and hope you'll join our brazil seminar next week next friday july 24th uh, at 9 a.m eastern time and uh, Marcia will be moderating a great panel that will focus on, on uh, racism, the challenge of racism in Brazil and building communities of belonging there, but it's titled, Do Black Lives Matter in Brazil? So thank you once and again. And let me ask you one yeah. little question. Are we going to, uh, we didn't discuss this before, are we gonna have this um, available as a video? Yes, on the site? It recorded. If anyone's interested, it'll be, it's Wonderful. being recorded and it will be archived on the NDI website. So Excellent. it will be, so you can go back and take a look at what, what people said and feel free to share it with others who weren't able to join us today. So thank you everyone, have a wonderful day. Thank you, looking forward to seeing Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.